So the goal of this discussion is to have a informal discussion about referring to race and ethnicity in grants. Um, there are a lot of changes, a lot of terms that I wouldn't use 10 years ago are now cool to use. And, and so we want to make sure that particularly for Anglos like myself, but I think for everybody, that we talk about various terms for race and ethnicity and the implications of each and why or why not this is either a good idea or not so good idea to uh, talk about. So Dr. Tassis, I've got my first question for you and Dr. George. Okay. Oh so when I moved to uh, Los Angeles, okay, I referred to Latinos living in Los Angeles as Hispanic. And my good friend Gustavo was not happy about my using this term. Could you guys explain what's the difference between Latino and Hispanic and why, what the implications are, are of each and why Gustavo might not have enjoyed my using this term and corrected me pretty vigorously? Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah. Because yeah. I see my camera is frozen in a very interesting state there, but. <laughs> okay, go for it. Um, so, I mean, I, ultimately I will, I will begin with the end in mind here to say that um, just like we talk about the self-identification and the importance of that, that I think we should ultimately honor um, the individual self-identification, right? Just like now we honor individuals' pronouns, et cetera, period in the story. That, that's sort of the end of the argument. So, so with that being said, for I think I explained before that um, for me, I think the Latina word is more sort of encompassing of my own self-identity. I think um, because those of us equity refer often to uh, countries or those of us coming from Spanish speaking countries, yes, but that um, have been, for example, either colonized or are known to be underserved. To me, the term Latino encompasses that, whereas the term Hispanic refers to the language, which we know is definitely a common um, sort of a but it does not necessarily reflect the heterogeneity of our culture. And I also think it, um, it in some senses, kind of limits or excludes those individuals who are of Latino ethnicity that do not necessarily speak the language, like my children, for example. Thank you, Kathy. So, Sophia, you're, you're going to be next on the hot seat. So when Gustavo was correcting me. He goes, Hispanic means Spain. Latino means the uh, Latin America. Hispanic is the term of conquerors. What mm -hmm. would you say to that? <laughs> okay. You had, you... So um, what I say to that, so I, I can say that for, first I'm from the Caribbean and the Caribbean region has always been coined and, and hooked with Latin America. So that's in America and the Caribbean. And growing up in the Caribbean and, and still now being in Miami, um, from our experience, Hispanic was a term that was used in the US and did not, we as a region did not self-identify as that. Um, and even now, um, living in Miami, folks who speak Spanish, individuals who speak Spanish prefer to be considered Latino or Latina and not Hispanic, although that is a designation that you have to fill out. Um, so for example, in the island of Hispaniola, where you have Dominican Republic and um, Haiti, some Haitians are now celebrating Hispanic Awareness Month and Day, whereas majority think, well, this is designated to this, the language um, and not necessarily consider themselves Latina or Latino. So I say, as um, Kathy said, that we have to respect what the people that we are designating or being designated as 
how they self-identify and how they identify the culture. And it's true, Hispanic is, is really seen as the conquerors um, rather than the people who've lived the experience um, in Latin America and the region. So what about the term Latinx? It seems like some people really don't like it and I don't get why. Can you help me out here? Um, I'm just speaking from what I've been told. Um. <laughs> this, is, this is what we want, is we want your personal experience. It's just like, yeah. help, help these four angles like myself out and just give them general guidance like you would give it to a friend. Right. So um, I was told to, to, to refer to folks from this region in a plural sense as Latine, or if you know it's male Latinos or Latinas and not Latin X because the X is offensive. Um, why it's offensive, I don't know. Um, I don't understand the offense, um, but it seems like it's some type of erasure and not reflective of the community and the culture. Um, Okay. Yeah. And so and so I I I avoid using the two. So Latin E or Latin A? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. I know the um I've heard of the reasons why the X is so offensive. And it goes back to um the way America have treated what they call the lower class. You know, we don't care about what your name is, just write an X. And so ah. it's a lazy way of saying whatever, you know, et cetera. It would be almost like me saying, instead of saying um, LD, LBGT community, I just say, you know, the alphabet people. If I say something like that, it's offensive. So when you say Latinx, it's a shortcut. But you got to understand that the people who are coming up with the terms for the grants usually don't have any of these people present. So... I can only imagine if somebody black was president when it president when they came out with the term Afro-American. I mean, like everybody didn't wear Afros, but it was a term. It was actually on documents. And so, but the X is indeed, it goes all the way back. And like, what, what are we an X? You know, to just, we don't care about your name, just sign an X. And it goes all the way back to, you know, uh slavery and and emancipation and things like that, where um, you wouldn't consider a full man or woman in that sense. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons I've heard that the X term is offensive. That's really helpful, Chris. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I got questions for you and Sophia next. Okay. So when my daughter went to NCCU child development preschool, now she's 25 now. So this is a while ago. Wait, she's 25? Yeah, man, she's 25. Yeah, so wow. she's 25. Um, so when she went to preschool, she would, her teacher brought out, Miss Brewer brought out a crayon box and had a white crayon and a black crayon and said, you're not white and I'm not black. And don't use either one of those terms. So now... You know, I, I was like never going to use that again. And then I see in the literature the word black. And I was hoping you guys could explain to me sort of why this term has been rehabilitated. Is it cool? Does everybody accept this term? Do only some people? What What is the better way to go? Is it African-American? You know, help this poor Anglo out. So the, the, the quick answer is, is that we have gotten to the point to where language inside of the house or inside of the community has spilled out. Like when you're inside a community, you know, black people call each other black, you know, hey, you know, you know, the black folks or, or stuff like that. Okay. But, you know, you can't take it upon yourself to assume that everybody is gonna be cool with you saying black, you know? And so that's the thing is that African-American or Afro-Caribbean, you know, whatever that the, the term is for the day is that it's only uh, acceptable because it's the norm. But to be honest with you, I know a lot of Black people who, <laughs> and listen to me say Black, I know a lot of African-American people who get offended 
when somebody who's not black calls them yes. black. You know, so, it's just it's just a it, it is almost like you're saying like how you come from um like uh like if you come from like Slavic language, you have stuff that you say or you come from um uh and you for use women. Uh, huh? Women. Women. We can call each other chicks, but God help yeah. us. God help yeah, us. Dude. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. You better not call a woman chick, but you know, and like, you know, when people who speak uh, Yiddish, they have different things they say, but if you're not of that, you, you just can't. But what happened is over time, you know, the lines got blurred with the, with the millennials and the, and the Zs. They, and so they just been able to say, and so now it seems well, like a lot of people are adopting it and they are offending people. You know, and not not even knowing okay. it, it's just it, it's just offending me. But and here's the thing: you don't know you was offended by it until when somebody yeah. said you like, whoa, you know. You so really if I was writing a grant, could I say individuals who self-identify as African American or Black, and then just put the term AA as an African American, or would that be acceptable? Here's what I would say. Always, when you when in doubt, call people with the NIH calls them because they've gone through all these things. You know, when you okay. that's when you write a grant. When people say uh, underserved or underprivileged, you know, or un, they say those terms, those are not NIH terms. It's underrepresented, you know. And so when you say URM, it is a URM and it's a term for that. And so I always tell people, listen. Just go towards that. You offend the least amount of people. You're not gonna be able to to make <laughs> satisfy everybody. It's just it's just the way it is. Okay, that's well, really can helpful. I, can I offer just a, yes. a couple of other comments because this is really interesting, Chris, and I'm, I'm learning you know so much, Christopher. Speaking of not calling people, <laughs> um, but for example, for the African American, another argument that I've heard that I made to Vicky because. I've been you know, somewhat convinced about that was that for some African-American black folk, they feel like the term African-American does not often reflect um, you know, sort of their experience, right? As they don't necessarily identify with Africa and they don't feel um, that America sort of is accepting through them. And so that the, you know, the term black really reflects, it's more reflective of the experience. That's one argument that I would love to sort of hear um, you guys' opinions about. And then with respect to what, what you mentioned around, you know, when in doubt, use the NIH terminology. One of our problems is that speaking of being at the table, oftentimes when these terms are chosen, we're not at the table, right? And so, um, in fact, this kinds of conversations and having folks like Vicky and you know you and others at the table that actually care enough to have these meaningful conversations really is what should be informing the, the NIA. So I'm curious as to what others think about that. Sophia, you've gone and studied the African diaspora and you can talk about the yeah. incredible diversity. Exactly. And so, um, we started with African American and it was used as a blanket term across all black people. And then um, it, I guess some of us in academia clearly, um, and then of course in the community appreciated that we're not, we're, we may look, have the same pigmentation, but we're not all the same and have the same experience. And so we're not a monolith. And so by now one using the word black to for me that's from my experience using the word black to cover all of us and then if you're speaking about a specific subgroup like african-americans who are in america and of african descent or afro-caribbean or african and then even now western east africa south and north right um it helps us especially when you're writing a grant helps us um, be able to use the language that can focus on and pay attention to the group that you're really studying or a plan to study. Um, and so for me, when I moved into the US, um, 
I didn't like the term African-American because I felt like I was not. Um, although I'm an American citizen, a US citizen, I wanted, I, I felt black encompassed as Chris was saying to um, Kathy or Christopher, that it encompassed the experience because when you see me, before I open my mouth, you see a black person. And it is only when I speak um, that you maybe start to you know, determine that I'm not African-American. Um, and so I like the word black because of that. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a interesting that they both brought up the, uh, uh, Kathy and uh, Sophia brought up really good points. And the idea of it is, is that they're exactly right. When you're talking about African-Americans, you are talking about African-Americans. You know, just like everybody who speaks Spanish is not from Spain, mm -hmm. you know, everybody who's black is not from, you know, is not African-American in the US. They didn't go up through the idea of, of being brought here, going through the, the things that the black people in America have gone through, hence the term African-American, but right. I have this problem, not this problem, but me and Gordon talk about this a lot. He was like, listen, they, they sort of put us against each other and make it seem like I have to say, no, I'm not African-American, but I'm black, you know, I'm African, you know, and I have friends who are from Ghana, they're like, listen, I identify with the struggle, but I can't take your struggle and use it to my advantage and say that I yeah. have felt the things that you felt, gone through the things that you felt, but I understand it because when people see me, mm -hmm. I don't show up as from Ghana, a Nigerian or Kenyan. I show up as black. A, a black person. <laughs> okay. like, as, as the poor Anglo who's trying to write my grant uh -huh. about diverse populations in Los Angeles that self-identify as African, Afro-Caribbean, black, um, you name it, okay. Is it acceptable to say individuals who, you know, individuals who self-identify as these terms and then just call it AA? Not if they're not African-American, no. Um, how about, about but, but it could be Afri who are African ancestry. That's what I would use. To you can do that. Yes. People who are of African ancestry and self-identify as either blah, 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 AA, meaning the yeah. African ancestry. Is From that African cool? Descent, AD, African descent, you know, okay. it can be a new one. Yeah, so, yeah. I was going to okay. say, be careful the African ancestry because I'm 35% African Yeah, ancestry. no, 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 I know, I know. And so I like, I, the like African, I like the African descent because, yes, you know, you look at populations who self-identify as Latina, and there are variable amounts of African, European, and indigenous ancestry. You look at individuals who self-identify as Afro-Caribbean, from Africa, African-American, and there's variable amounts of African ancestry, European ancestry, and indigenous ancestry. So it, it's a very sort of cool thing that once we start looking at individuals that and particularly at the genetic ancestry, we go beyond, um, you know, what we self-identify as. So we have a few more minutes left, and I have questions for both David on and Virginia. Okay, so when I was living in North Carolina, like people who hailed from China, Malaysia, Taiwan, Singapore, everybody was referred to as Asian. Now, coming here to Los Angeles, I had the same experience I had as a kid growing up in New York City, that we didn't identify people as Asian. We identified them specifically from where they originate. So just, I'd love to hear your guys' perspective on this. Is it annoying to be referred to Asian all the time? Or what, what do you guys think about all of this? I think, I think it's about everybody's experience. So I, I actually, you know, I, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, not, for example, not all Asians are Chinese. You know, there are also, you, I hear that a lot too. You know, it's the assumption that 
you know, if you if you look like me, you're all going to be, you know, Chinese, for example. But it's also the acknowledgement that within this whole group, there are also many different um, backgrounds, many different experiences and different ways of identification. There's Japanese Americans, there's Korean Americans, there's the Southeast Asian, you know, area as well. But we're not all Chinese, for example, because <laughs> in my experience, the first assumption is that while I, as a Chinese American, I, you know, sure, you know, that that applies to me, but it doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. So it's just that there needs to be an acknowledgement that within this group, just like with any of the um, discussions that we had today, that there are many different backgrounds, many different, you know, um, ways people identify. And, and as Dave, and as we can see in David's experience too, it's, it, it's not, you know, it's not always under the Chinese umbrella too. There's the political, you know, sort of um, the history here in terms of the, the mainland China versus the Taiwan, you know, but, you know, kind of um, history there. So just being able to acknowledge that. I have friends who are Mandarin speaking. And then when we grew up, um, there were, my dad had a lot of friends who were Cantonese speaking and had come, you know, a long time earlier. Is there also a language barrier as well? Or is there a language division? Yeah, the, the yes, uh, yes, yes, Virginia, you go ahead first. Okay, yeah, yeah, at least you know, it, it's the um, it's sort of different dialects that are spoken <laughs> as well. So, for example, I grew up you know, speaking Mandarin Chinese, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the sort of the, I guess the official <laughs> language, if you will. Um, but I cannot speak Cantonese, for example, I may, you know, but, but so it's, it's there, and, and there's more dialects, even if we're just looking at, um, you, you know, the, the Chinese experience or the Taiwanese experience, if you will. And there's even dialects within, within Taiwanese as well, within, within the island. And so, so there, there is, you know, even though, you know, it's, you may not speak, you know, and, and even, even though you may be sort of, you know, either identify as Chinese or Taiwanese American, there are still some differences in terms of the dialects that everyone knows and everyone can understand. So, so it's that language component as well, yeah. But I do have questions for Chris. So how about HBCU? So is it still cool when we refer to the, the historical black university or college? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Someone asked me that the other day, and it is because it is um, it is like a marker of a historic event because most historically black colleges and universities um, have have you know gone under or have haven't survived the, the years, and so it's almost like um, it is considered um a recognition and so when you say historically black uh college or university it's a recognition that this institution survived or it is one that strived when it was completely segregated and this was the only way that blacks could be educated and so if you hear anybody who went to hbcu and i've gone to two of them you know there's a level of pride associated with it and they can't wait to say, yes, I went to an HBCU. Um, but it is also very offensive if you don't take the time out to just say it instead of just messing it up, butchering the word. I don't heard people call it an H-U-B-C. And, you know, it's it's just like everything else. When you learn someone's name, you want to pronounce it right, even though I jack up a lot of people's name, not on purpose. But I do understand, you know, the idea about it is that, you know, um, that is considered a historic uh, badge of honor um, for those institutions. And they, they rely heavily on uh, being classified as such because you have now minority serving institutions that were able to come along now because they didn't have to go through the problems that you had to go through when you started off as HBCU in the 1800s. You know, I think I, with Howard is 18 or something, you know, but that's fascinating that you had schools that started off then that can still exist now, especially with all of the, the turmoil. And so HBCU is, is definitely uh, um, a term that is accepted. Thank you. So our half hour is coming to a close. 
So I'm going to try to summarize this discussion. I want to thank all of you guys for being so like helpful and I've learned a ton and I, you know, you guys have been so awesome. Um, I think the first rule of the road is it's good to have friends who are not the same as you. And it's good to forge those friendships and to find ways of having conversations of like, you know, hey, I'm not sure what the right thing is here. I want to do the right thing. Can you help me? So make friends. Okay, that's number one. Um, number two, okay. Hispanic, use the term with delicacy. It has a lot, it's pretty loaded and it can mean some pretty offensive things. Latinx, don't use the X. X is bad. X is lack of personhood and has horrible historic consequences and implications. So use Latin A or Latin E, okay? Um, Latinas is always nice to refer to women who are from um, Mexico. It works well in my experience as well. So um, the third point is that people are diverse, that we try to put people into boxes and categories. And that's all fine and good because it can help to categorize and help describe people's experiences. But in doing this sort of broad generalization, we run into a lot of trouble. Um, there's a lot of dif discussion about the best way to call individuals who are of African ancestry, if you are an Anglo like me and have minimal African ancestry. I have a little bit, but not very much. Um, so, you know, what you need to do there is be very careful and that using the term African American can be quite acceptable for people who self identify as African American, um, but you gotta be careful there. The term black, is you have to use very carefully if you are not a person who is of African ancestry, you can do a lot of harm. So be careful in how you do this. Um, what is that term we agreed on? It was African A. African descent. African descent. AD sounds perfect to me. S-I-A-D, self-identify as African descent. <laughs> you know, and African, I... African ancestry is complicated too, because then you're starting to imply that you're thinking about um, ancestry rather than somebody's experience. Okay, lastly, Asians are not a monolith. And particularly when you refer to somebody as being Chinese, that has got potential problems there. Um, as we diversify and have, you know, expand as a, as a United States and, and, you know, our population reflects the population of the world, um, you know, again, here we are. So I wanna thank everybody and just if anybody has any closing remarks, I'll shut up and you guys can just say one or two things to close or we can close now. All is good. I just, Vicky, if I could, I could. I just want to um, say thank you for having this um, conversation and that I'm really excited about where we are moving um, and that we acknowledge that race is an experience which is different from our genetics. And so when we write our grants and we plan our studies, we should think about how the experience of being Asian, African American, Black, um, Hispanic, Latina, um, Latino, Latine, um, influences the science that we're trying to, to put forth. Thank you to all. And thank I, you. I thank think you. this is going to be really helpful to people writing grants. I, you know, again, thank you to everybody. And thank you for having the kindness and the courage to speak your mind. And, and, you know, y'all are awesome. Thank you so much.